G'day everyone and welcome to the Pulses podcast. My name is Brian and I'll be your host. Today we have Associate Professor Matt McDonald. Hello. As well as this we have our PhD students from the school, Simon Kelly. Hi Brian. And Sarah Warner. Hello. And today's topic for the podcast is the Australian, Australian federal election. So at the time of recording, the House of Representatives is 77 coalition, well maybe 76, there's still one seat up in the air. 68 Labour and 5 on the crossbench. The Senate is still 11 seats unconfirmed, but at the moment the coalition is 27, Labour 23 and 6 confirmed on the crossbench. So we don't have a clear representation of what's probably going to be the end of the Senate, but we do probably have a good idea of where things are going in the House of Reps. Um, for our international listeners, the coalition is the term we use to describe the coalition between the Liberal Party our Conservative Party, which obviously is different to if you're listening from Canada because your Liberal Party is Progressive Party. So um, sorry to confuse you, Canada. Mm. As well as this, we have the National Party that's in the coalition and their constituents. Um, on the other side, in Australian politics, we have the Labour Party, which is the more progressive left, generally speaking. So um, let's get into this sort of discussion. How did the election go for everyone? Well, I enjoyed it. Yes. I mean, it was, uh, it, was, it was fun to watch. It's always a spectacle. For those who aren't used to Australian elections, and I've had the pleasure of voting in elections in the, in the UK, one of the things that is, is horrible about the UK experience is that you'll go into voting booths and there's no opportunity to buy sausages on a bread, there's no opportunity to buy lamingtons, you know, and they wonder why there's such a problem with the democratic system in the UK at the moment, I'll tell you. The absence of a sausage sizzle, it's really a causal effect. So from that point of view, the election election days are always this uh, sort of wonderful uh, celebration, I think, of democracy in all the right kind of ways with, uh, you know, cake stalls and sausage sizzles. So we all enjoy it, and then there's a bit of a spectacle at the end of the evening uh, for those of us who are inclined that way to watch the results come through. But if you're actually asking about how the uh, political parties uh, went individually and how the results panned out, it'd be fair to say I think that uh, there was a it was a disappointing outcome for the government, and there was certainly a sense that uh, they would win relatively comfortably. At least that was uh, what most people were betting on, and that uh, we'd see Labor struggling under Bill Shorten. Instead, what we saw was that uh, the coalition really, to the extent that they have, are likely to get a majority, that it really is razor thin. And they call the double disillusional election, and now it looks like the Senate they'll be working with, the upper house they'll be working with, is going to be far more unruly than what they had before and create some really challenging policy outcomes. Yeah. So this is a good point. For those who don't understand, what do we mean by a double dissolution election? Yeah, um, so basically in Australia you've got two Houses of Parliament, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Now, the House uh, goes to an election every two and a half, three years or so. At the same time, half of the Senate at a normal election is, is up um, a, a bit similar to the United States where a third of the Senate is elected every, uh, at every uh, election time. Uh, in this instance, a double dissolution means that the House of Representatives faced the people and the whole Senate, all 76 senators had to go um, to the people. Why is that? The double dissolution mechanism is basically a mechanism to resolve a deadlock between the two Houses of Parliament. Okay, if the Senate doesn't pass bills that are coming up from the House of Representatives, okay, there is a mechanism, uh, it's fairly complicated, we don't need to go into it, but to send the whole Senate to face the people and hopefully resolve that deadlock. So why did um, Malcolm Turnbull decide to actually do a double dissolution election? Well, he decided to do a double dissolution election because he wanted to have a Senate who would pass his legislation, basically. And he may not have got what he wanted. In fact, he's probably knocked off some of his um, percentage in the House of Representatives and will have a difficult Senate to work with. So he has not got what he was asking for. So this hasn't been a... Well, you're still in power, so you can't always knock the fact that, you know, someone, um, Malcolm Turnbull, has, for better or worse, won the election, but arguably he's probably, he's well at the very least, he's not in a better position than what he was before the election. So is this 
problematic for his leadership going forward? Absolutely. It's it's difficult to see who an alternative leader would be. It's still the case that uh, you know someone like Tony Abbott is uh, on the nose for a large part of the uh, a large part of the electorate still. And like Kevin Rudd before him, Malcolm Turnbull has built his legitimacy within the power on his own popularity as a leader, and that's where it gets really complicated because he's struggled. I think. He's seen as the left edge of the Liberal Party, of the coalition, and then you've got people like Corey Bernardi on the far right and those who are inclined to that vision of uh, the Conservative political party who are actually want radically different policy on issues like climate change, on social issues like gay marriage. So it places him in a really difficult position. My sense is with the election, what he was personally hoping for was to build a mandate to actually marginalise those elements of his own party to be able to push for legislation that was more consistent with his vision of what the Liberal Party should do. In fact, even though he's won re-election, he's made that far more difficult than it probably was before. We've got a, the, the situation in the House of Representatives where the government is formed is that you need 76 seats uh, for a majority. It looks like the government might get to 77. Now, a really tight contest like that can have can cut both ways onto a government. On one hand, it can unify the governing party or parties because the majority is so thin and you'd rather be in power than not. At the same time, it also means that a very small handful of dissidents can bring the government down or, or threaten to bring the government down. What does it mean for the coalition to have... Um, 77 seats compared to 76. Why is that more really important? Well, when more is better, but 77, 76 seats is what they need in order to be able to form a government. But they still need to provide a speaker and they also need to consider how they can operate in the House. So um, if they, uh, you know, they need to run a really tight ship. So they can't afford to have scandals, they can't afford to have too many people off doing other things, you know, there's a relationship you have with the opposition party where you have pairs, which means that if you're out of the House, then they agree to um, allow that to not change the vote in the House. But if you've got a really tight, um, tight, um, uh, you know, government, you can't, um, you can't necessarily rely on all of these things. So they, they need to think about the Speaker and they need to think about how tight that ship's going to be in terms of people being in their seats when they need to be and people not dissenting in the way that Simon was just talking about in terms of um, whether or not people uh, you know, want to run alternative agendas. So the government has to work really hard. And we have seen that before um, in the Coalition Party. So famously, the now Deputy Prime Minister, um, who's the head of the National Party, um, has famously crossed the floor mm. in the past. So that would be quite problematic if, say, yeah. um, fringe elements of yeah. the Liberal Party decide to... I think you'd be less likely to see crossing the floor than you might be to see some sort of backroom holding, you know, holding out for a particular policy position. Mm. I mean, one of the, the... Of course, the broader issue is that what we like to talk about in political science is this difference between a weak and strong party discipline that you have in Australia relative to somewhere like the US, where in the US you might vote for your local congressman who you expect to be representing local issues. In the in the Australian context, you're essentially... And in the American context, of course, it's not unusual for people to vote on different party lines. Lobbying of individual congressmen, therefore, takes on such an important dimension. Whereas in Australia, with strong party discipline, there is a sense that people will toe the line. You do get exceptions, but it's relatively rare. Yeah. Now, one of the things that has been mentioned already is this notion of mandate. And I th think this is a really important issue to sort of come uh, that when a party has won, as the coalition has done, uh, the majority, they always tend to talk about the people have given them a mandate. And even though we have this unwieldy Senate, the Senate should get in line because the people have voted us in with a mandate. How does that actually work in principle? Is this actually something that exists? Well, the concept of mandate um, is a pretty slippery one and doesn't have a great reputation. I would I would suggest in 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 sort of um, in in notions of democratic governance. The reason for that is this: um, governments will often say we have a mandate to implement a, a certain policy because we won the election. But on other policies that might be panning out uh, as not so popular, they'll walk away from them. 
Um, now, surely the idea of a mandate um, would, would be that all of your policies um, need to be implemented mandatorily. <laughs> so you can't just drop the ones that seem unpopular um, and go with the ones that you want to uh, implement. So yeah, the, hence, hence this idea of mandate doesn't have a great um, sort of reputation. So it's basically all talk with very little follow through. Yeah, well... Uh, yeah, I, I would say that it's it, it's an interesting point that I mean, this election, you know, like they've sort of said, we have a mandate to govern, which means will you pass our legislation? That's what they mean. Whatever it is we put up, whether or not we said we were going to do it before the, le the election, we want you to pass our legislation. That's what they mean by mandate to govern. But I think it is an interesting point. Like if you think about the 2012 election in Queensland where the Newman government had a resounding um, majority victory, they thought they had a mandate to govern and they thought that they could not lose for many, many, many years, but they prosecuted an agenda which simply would, did not resonate with the people of Queensland and they were tossed out three years later. So I think that kind of idea of a mandate to govern is quite a questionable idea. I actually think it's best understood as a rhetorical <laughs> device. It really is. It's something that is employed as a way of trying to cow uh, both the political opposition, but in this instance, in the context of this election, I think particularly focused on independents and those from minor parties to try to say, do not stand in the way of our legislation because, you know, we have formed government, even though we've formed government on two-party preferred by less than a percent this time around. Talking about the opposition party, I think we do need to spend a little bit of time talking about Labour. Now, for many people, Labour has done much better in this election than I think anyone really thought they would, including the polling data did not show that they were going to do as well. So is this a really good outcome for Bill Shorten? Look, um, I think the key word uh, there is is how well Labor did relative to how well people thought they would Okay, prior to the election. And I think this is really important. Leading up to the election, all the sort of the experts, the commentariat, the journalists and the pundits and so on were saying the Turnbull government will be returned but with a reduced majority. Okay, even on the Friday before election day I saw the front page of the Australian newspaper and the Australian Financial Review newspaper both had front page stories saying Turnbull government to be um, re-elected. Now that's very, and every time I heard that or saw things like that I thought that's not good for the government. Because if you create expectations in people's minds that the government is going to be comfortably returned, well then you might just think, hey, I can give them a kick in the shins, vote against them. And if enough people do that, you get the result that we did, which saw Labor pick up 12 seats. Okay, they went from 55 to 67 seats. Okay, definitely better than they expected to. Um, we can just have a look, though, at the national votes. Um, the coalition government suffered a 3.5% swing against it, but Labor only picked up 1.5% of that. So a good 2% of the anti-government swing went to other parties, not to, straight to the opposition. So my, my view is that it was, it was good and bad for Labor, this election in some ways, that actually I think they looked like a more coherent and um, unified political party than may have been expected and that probably wouldn't be applied necessarily to the to the coalition and um, when Bill Shorten dropped the zingers and started to get on message he looked comfortable in the election campaign in ways that many people wouldn't have expected in the lead up but there's no getting away from the fact that they still managed only 35 percent of the primary vote it's a low primary vote for Labor. They did well to get some um, preferences going their way, but at the end of the day, they were also were put had to put up a really significant fight against the Greens in a handful of seats to try to prevent the Greens taking off seats, including really high profile and relatively safe electorates in inner city Sydney and, um, and Melbourne. So that's, and that's likely to be an issue in the longer term. Um, for Labor as well. Oh, yeah, I mean, I agree. There are issues for Labor, and I think, um, you know, it's interesting to see the percentage that they increased their primary vote by, but I think you could have to say that Labor was not expecting to pick up that many seats, and the fact that they picked up that many seats is pretty is pretty good for them. And when you're operating in opposition with a higher um, number of seats, it makes an enormous difference. 
and you know, so I think it's a good outcome for Labor. They, they should, they'll be happy with that. And I think the other person will be happy is Bill Shorten. That, that was my next question. <laughs> um, is Bill Shorten in a much more comfortable position now than, we'll say, he was before the election? Yes. Yeah, so the, the Labor Party rules on electing their leader say, um, and these, these are only a, a recent introduction, um, say that a, a leader is only open to challenge at the end of an election period. If, if they stay in place once the election's been finalised, they then are, uh, are, are pretty much uh, in, in office for the, the next three years. They can't be challenged. So seeing as no one challenged Bill Shorten uh, last week, under the rules, he's got a three-year stretch of um, sort of, yeah, and has probably earned it, given the result. So we've talked about the two big players, the Coalition and the Labour Party. But I thought, um, before we move on to some sort of specific issues, I wanted to take a little bit of time and looking at the swathe of minor parties that we have. Um, and of course, we've got the Greens. Um, and we've, the Greens are a relatively well-known entity within Australian politics that probably did better than some people were expecting, but probably not as well as they would have liked. But one of the key things I wanted to talk about is this sort of rise of a lot of very minor parties, especially personality-based parties. So we have the Nick Xenophon party, and we have the return of Pauline Hanson, um, which, as many people have wanted to mention, is not just a Queensland phenomenon. One Nation polled very well in a number of states in the Senate. So we have Pauline Hanson probably back in the Australian Parliament. So how did that happen? There, there are parallels. I mean, I, can, I think there are some parallels between the success of minor parties generally, but Pauline Hanson specifically, and this broader trend that we've seen in, in the uh, UK with the move mm. to Brexit in the US the with the rise of people like... Trump, this, there's a large cohort of people who feel disenfranchised, who feel that society may be doing well, but that actually isn't flowing through to them and their experience. And in that context, it becomes very easy to throw your weight behind someone who's saying, well, essentially, it's the fault of these other people and we're going to speak with your voice for the first for the first time. So that, I think, is definitely part of that phenomenon. I think you're being quite... Uh generous and maybe walking a very even line about who these supporters of these minor parties are when we're talking about Pauline Hanson or uh, the UKIP supporters in the UK we're talking about a kind of a move to the right and I think in Australia that move has been there for a long time that kind of base of a minor party a right minor party has been there for a while but um, it's certainly a move to a right and you can't you can't sort of sidestep around that it's not just I don't want to vote major party it's I want to vote for a right wing party. Yes, um, yes and no, because what we saw last election, the big phenomena was the Palmer United Party. So we saw a huge swing towards Palmer United. Now, the three years since that election has not been good to the Palmer United Party, and their sure. election turnout has absolutely smashed. But we've seen in many cases most of that just flow straight to another minor party. Is it just that Pauline Hanson has name brand recognition? So people looking for an alternative when I know who that is? Um, look, uh, so let's let's give some context here. Pauline Hanson was first elected in 1996, so 20 years ago. She lasted for one term, okay, um, and managed to get a senator elected for Queensland, okay. She's arguably done better this time round because it looks like she might have two or three senators elected from Queensland, possibly one from New South Wales, uh, if memory serves correct. So that's a pretty big block of power in the Senate that, uh, that she can wield. Um, Hanson has always uh, struck me as, as wanting to return to a, a, a sort of golden age of white picket fences um, quarter acre blocks from the 50s and 60s when the country was prosperous, um, the, the long golden, uh, uh, the, the long post war economic boom, and so on and so forth. Um, what she's railing against 
is this what you might call economic rationalist or neoliberal consensus, which both of the main parties to a greater or lesser extent seem to subscribe. Um, she would say, why the hell can't we have tariff barriers for our farmers if they need protection and so on and so forth? Well, I would say that one of her key platforms is a sort of an anti-multiculturalism and on a slightly even more scary note, climate scepticism. Um, and that's the public platform. So she does have these other kinds of um, kind of strings to her bow, but the public platform is really kind of an anti um, an anti immigrant and anti Islam um, you know platform, and I think that that's I imagine I don't know what the mind of the One Nation voter is. Is that where that's partly what they're picking up? Yeah. So we've got One Nation in the sort of the northern states, but one of the big surprises is Nick Xenophon in South Australia doing yeah. very well, not just picking up, so Nick Xenophon is a regular in South Australian politics, he's been a senator there for a while, he almost carried two quotas for himself in the last election. But he's done really well picking up a number of Senate seats and at least one um, seat in the House of Representatives, so he may be a growing force. So. Is this sort of party politics based on a person something that we should be looking forward to more of happening? Or are these sort of like candles on the wind, they flare up, they look impressive, and then just don't last like the Palmer United Party? Well, I saw an interview with Nick Xenophon just after the election, and he was talking about um, what they might change their name of their party to, because it's currently called the Nick Xenophon Party. And he suggested that his... Um, desired choice was the party that's not great but it's better than the other guys <laughs> which I thought was kind of like... Hard to fit on a billboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said it wasn't playing well with his other people. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that he's done really well and it, there's clearly a place for that particular voice and he has obviously operated... South Australia. Yes, that's South Australia may be that place for that <laughs> voice, that is true. But if they, you know, he's, I think he has been a good politician. Mm. So it's, it's, South Australia is, is actually key here because go back to the 1970s and you had so you yeah. had a breakaway party called the Australian Democrats formed by a disgruntled uh, Liberal Party ex-minister, Don Chip. Um, his famous slogan was, his party was there to keep the bastards honest. Mm. Okay, And they positioned themselves very much as a centre party, um, neither of the left or the right. Now, Xenophon has also explicitly... Put him, posited himself as a centre party, okay, in between the two main parties. Incidentally, South Australia was the Australian Democrats' um, uh, best state in terms of performance, okay. And this, this brings actually uh, to mind another a really important um, concept when we look at the decline in the major party votes and the rise of minor parties and independent votes. Um, there's been research done that shows that. If you were a rusted on major party supporter, okay, and then at some point you decide to break away from your long held um, party identification, once you make that switch, you will keep switching, okay? So, what we've seen over time is in increasing numbers of voters breaking away from their sort of ideological home, home base, and then from then on, they're up for grabs. What that means is that the rusted on supporters for the major parties, that that base is shrinking and the swinging middle is growing. Um, and it's exactly that sort of um, appeal that Xenophon, it's those voters that, that Xenophon yeah. can appeal to. Yeah. So now that we've sort of had the sort of election, we kind of have the idea of what the makeup of the parliament's going to be, though there are still some questions outstanding on how the Senate's going to um, appear out at the end. What I wanted to take a moment is just look at what are some of the policy outcomes? How do you see going f forward, we can look at things such as the environment and education. How is this next parliament actually going to be able to tackle those sort of issues? It's almost going to be an issue by issue basis, really, with some of these things, you know, there's and whether the pressures for change from what the government went into the election uh, with are going to come from the conglomeration of minor parties, a stronger opposition, or indeed his own party, has, has been the case with something like superannuation policy, for example. The, now the makeup of the Senate means that things like higher education deregulation, which had always been at the back of the mind of the government, I think is now probably off the table. It's almost impossible 
to imagine that getting through. But something like climate change, I think, is a fascinating example here in terms of what policy might look like. There are some who were initially concerned that actually, you know, it was pretty clear that this was something Malcolm Turnbull was interested in progressing, a stronger position on climate change. It's pretty clear that direct action is both prohibitively expensive and unlikely, to very unlikely to get us at the targets that the government had actually committed to uh, at Paris. So in that context, it looked likely that the government was going to push for stronger action. Now with the makeup of the, uh, of the Senate, again, it's going to be difficult, not least given that Pauline Hanson has actually embraced, re-embraced climate denial, apparently has a role now back in the Australian Parliament. Even Tony Abbott recognised that climate change was happening and, and human-induced, even if occasionally um, toying with climate scepticism. So, you know, on an issue like that, it's really fascinating that some in his own party are concerned that actually Turnbull will try to use the, the uncertainty in the Senate to push through progressive legislation, whereas others seem more concerned that actually if he had any ambition in that direction, it's going to be very difficult now with the makeup of the Senate to actually get that through. So, I, th- yeah. I would also say that it's difficult with the makeup of the House of Representatives for him to actually put that policy platform up inside his own party. Well, that's what got him unstuck last time when he was opposition leader. Um, his support for um, that sort of policy yeah. was the sticking point for Tony Abbott to unseat him, and that went well for everyone. So there's some really interesting sort of policy issues, but um, just before we finish up, the polls didn't re- really show what was going to happen um, in the lead up. So what can we, what lessons can we learn uh, from this election about using polls and how polls are collected? Well, I, I want it to, on the record that I had money on a hung parliament. So I, and no, it sounds strange <laughs> to admit something that now looks like it's going to have lost me money, but I was perilously close for a while there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It did look like actually one of the interesting things was that the polls weren't necessarily all pointing to a coalition victory. What what was clearly pointing to a coalition victory were polls saying to people, who do you think will win? And also some of the newspaper editorials that were really railing behind the idea of uh, the government being re-elected. So I would say actually that, that a really close analysis of the polls suggests it was always going to be really, really yeah. close. And that actually it was the way in which the, some of the polling was represented in the lead up that uh, suggested that actually it was going to be a comfortable victory for the, for the government. Yeah, I mean, I, that's exactly the same thought that I came to. I had originally thought, oh, you know, this is an example of polls not working and what does that mean? Because, you know, there is a lot of discussion about polls, you know, polls are taken in very traditional kinds of environments. They rely on kind of phoning home phones, which people don't necessarily use. And so pollsters are having to kind of work a lot harder in order to find meaningful poll um, samples. Um, But it would seem, if you do look at the opinion polls, that they're not necessarily correct on the primary vote, but on the two-party preferred, they're pretty accurate. So they kind of come out at, you know, pretty close to what actually has occurred. So I'm not sure what that means. So good use for pollsters. They have to work more, (laughs) but they might get a good result. Okay. Um, There is significantly more that we could talk about, and I think we will come back to this point throughout the year as things become more confirmed and we get some more policy things. Um, But I think we'll draw it to a close there. So firstly, I want to thank you to all my panellists for um, coming in today to record it. And thank you, listeners, for listening in. And we'll see you next time for another Pulses podcast.